Welcome to everyone. We have a really um, outstanding number of attendees today, so I think there's, there are a lot of interest in the decision tables and the decision models. So um, the title of this presentation is Why Decision Tables Are Not Enough, but that's not to say that decision tables are not useful. So I think many of you have found them to be quite useful, and they have been around for many years. And um, there's also excellent research, even occurring today, which I'll mention um, in, in a few minutes, relating to decision tables and coming up with a standard. Uh, however, what we find in client organizations, we see a lot of single and unconnected decision tables that can be better represented as one holistic decision model. And not only that, but we also see that uh, a lot of variations in how an organization configures its decision tables. So even within the same project, uh, we see different formats and different um, presentations or different um, representations of decision models that can be a little bit confusing for business people in going from one format to another. Um, and so we conclude from that in, in real world environments, most often decision tables are not perceived as something that should be delivered with uniformity in its rigor and its representation. So today what I want to do is I want to start with the benefits of decision tables and then the presentation will look at the idea of an entire model to hold the logic of multiple decision tables in a very particular way and that's the way that conforms to all of the 15 principles of the decision model because it's those principles that give the decision model a particular uniformity and rigor and representation that we seem to be lacking in the way we're practicing with decision tables. So the format of the presentation is to review a common kind of decision table that we see out there all the time and walk you step by step through how to transform that kind of a decision model into a corresponding uh, I'm sorry, decision table, into a corresponding decision model. And so at each step, though, I will also point out the decision model principle or the principles that justify that step. And because when I do that, you'll be able to see how the uniformity of the decision model unfolds like a science in a step-by-step -step manner. Let's see if I can move us forward. Okay, Michael, I'm not able to move forward. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I'll let you, Mike, I'll tell you when to turn it each time so we don't struggle at each slide. Um, but anyway, here is the agenda for today's webinar. It starts by taking a look at the kind of decision models that we see in organizations today, which are probably much like the ones you've seen or created, and the, and the same for us. And after that, though, the core of the webinar is the set of these six steps for transforming such a single decision table into one that can serve as a component in a holistic, normalized decision model. And then finally, at the end, when I wrap up, um, there's a summary of each of those steps correlated to the decision model principles um, that each one represents. So if we go to the next page, um, it's very important for us to recognize that decision tables have long been a very successful technique for representing structured logic. And structured logic is conditions leading to conclusions, which is exactly what the decision model also is about. So uh, this page has five benefits that we want to recognize because I want to make sure that we don't lose these when we transform a decision table into a piece of a decision model. So the first benefit is that a decision table is an intuitive and visual representation. And it's, that means it circumvents the need for other less intuitive representations, which might be formal language or unintuitive grammar or fill-in-the-blank templates. And the second benefit is that because they're visual, it's easy to use a decision table to communicate logic to different kinds of audiences. So that means business people and technical people. However, we do find sometimes that decision tables out there have a lot of technical jargon in them or technical formulations or, or naming conventions that can sometimes mean that they're not so easy to communicate to a wide audience. So we want to keep in mind that we want to make sure our decision models are, are very uh, business friendly. The third benefit is that a decision table is an easy form for, for determining whether the logic in it is complete, consistent, and non-redundant. So we want to carry that over into our decision model. The fourth is interesting. It says decision tables lend themselves to easy automation in certain technologies. For example, most business rule engines or business rule management systems, such as IBM's iLog and, and Joule's, accept 
decision tables as a means of inputting or changing logic. And, and that's because the automation of decision tables in their engines is particularly straightforward. So it, the, that translation happens quite easily. And the fifth benefit is that today decision tables are the target of ongoing research and standards. So I just want to point out that the OMG now has a subcommittee, if you are not aware of this, called Decision Model Notation. And that subcommittee is an active one today, and it addresses logic as, as uh, represented in decision tables, as well as a general decision model format. And they will be producing their first public uh, document in the very beginning of 2013. And Larry and I have been invited to participate in that subcommittee. And so we're going to keep an eye on that, too. So that's very exciting. Now, today's webinar, then, is not a debate between decision table theory, because there are people who are very passionate about that, versus decision model theory, because we're very passionate about that also. Um, but instead, I want to focus it on the current state of practice of decision tables out there and a practical step-by-step -step approach by which you can um, evolve them into decision models where appropriate. So on this page, um, I want to show you some common decision table formats that we find um, in practice today. And um, we find two common aspects. The first is that most organizations who are doing decision models usually create single unconnected decision, I mean, decision tables, even if they can connect together. The organizations don't tend to connect them together. They see them as discrete, separate um, deliverables and not connected to each other. The second commonality is that most organizations support different formats, and I want to explain each of these formats here, um, and there are many more, but these are the common ones. So in the top left decision table, the condition names appear in the first column in the first two rows under the row labeled conditions, and so these are age and income. The actions in that table appear in the first column, but in the bottom two rows because they're under the row labeled actions. So we have two actions here keep on contact list, and add to next market campaign. The details of the conditions and actions are inside each of the cells themselves. So interp to interpret the column labeled 1, you would read that column as if age is less than 21, then keep on contact list is yes, and add to next market campaign is no. Now let's look at the decision table to the right of this one, which we find um, in this format also. It has conditions and actions listed in the first column, sort of similarly to the first one, the first decision table, not quite exactly the same way. And this one seems to have yes and no answers in the cells instead of the operations that you see in the first one. And now let's look at the decision table on the bottom. The decision table there, we have the condition and conclusion names appear combined in the top left cell. So we have customer spending per order slash customer status. So that means that the customer spending per order, that's the less than or equal to $10,000 and, and the between 10 and 100. And then the customer status is the high value customer, medium value customer, and low value customer. And so then the conclusions to this are actually in the cells. And if you were to read the logic for the column labeled less than or equal to 10,000 and the row labeled high value customer. The way you interpret that is if customer status is a high value customer and the customer spending per order is less than or equal to 10,000, then the discount is 20%. So I suppose looking at these things, each one of these is intuitive in its own way, but you can see that among just three representations, different parts of the logic are in different parts of the table. And the names and the details are, are not um, noted in a very rigid manner. And so if we look at the next page, um, we can con contrast this to the decision model. The decision model in practice has only one structure, and every decision model adheres to the same 15 principles. And behind these principles, is the idea that normalization is the way we group logic statements together, and something called inferential integrity, which I will explain, is the way to connect those groups together. There's no other way. And um, this is similar to how data is organized in relational model, except that this is dealing with structured logic. So for those of you who are not totally familiar with the decision model, this page has the beginning of a decision model. It, it starts with the blue octagon at the top, which is connected to I see, you see here two green tablet-shaped icons and lines between them. This structure 
is universal characteristic of every single decision model everywhere. So moreover, the, and the details, what's in the cells, actually are not in the structured diagram. They're in two-dimensional tables that are behind those green icons. And those tables also have one core representation. So they're not variations in how you represent them. So any logic you put in a decision model, business people will see the same exact look and feel and there will be no question about where is the condition, where is the conclusion, um, and how do, I, how do I read this table. So the way I want to reorient your thinking now is to walk through the six steps of the transformation. And just before we go to the next page, okay, we can go there, it's fine. I know that some of you don't have much knowledge about the decision model, but you'll still be able to follow the six steps. And you'll, you'll be able to see how a common decision table, um, what it looks like when we transform it into decision model format. But you will probably want more details because you'll be missing a lot of the theory and the details of the principles themselves. So as Michael mentioned, um, you have three options at least to learn more. If you want a textual explanation that's free, um, you can download our primer. Um, or if you want to buy our, our book, you can um, get a very much in-depth explanation of the decision model. If you want to listen to a recording, you can listen to a past webinar that I've done on the decision model. But if you prefer a live presentation to listen to, you can listen to the October presentation that Larry will be doing. And um, so all of those are ways you can catch up for what I'm not going to cover in this webinar. But the transformation steps that I'm about to go through are more important than they may seem at first. So let me just talk to you about why they're important. The transition from thinking the way you think of individual unconnected decision tables to thinking of a decision model is a fundamental leap in maturity. And the leap has fascinating implications for the business because high-level business managers, we find they're very much interested in decisions and decision models, but they're less interested in the individual decision tables. So you get more management attention. The leap also has fascinating implications for software innovations because it opens the door to model-based functionality, like comparing whole models of logic, not just one decision table to another, or validating whole models against the principles, or creating different views of a model, um, or sharing whole decision models across processes. So it, it elevates the whole idea of the logic to something that's much more shareable and much more of a strategic deliverable. So the last topic on here, or the last item before we go into the steps, is whether to do bottom-up or top-down transformation from decision tables to decision models. Some of you already know that we at KPI always build our decision models today from the top down, starting from a structural model like you just saw. We do not tend to start with the details of decision tables or other sources and, and try to back into the structure. But I'm going to walk you through that approach because if you're new to the decision model and you have decision tables already, that's the way you're going to become familiar with the decision model. And when you get more experience, you'll be able to look at a, a group of decision models and just pull out the structure first and then dive into the details. Um, so I'm going to do the bottom up and top rather than the top down. So as you have seen, decision tables in the real world take on many different formats. So I'm going to use the format on this page because it's a common one. So to transform this one into the beginnings of a decision model, I'm going to systematically walk through the six transformation steps. And through those steps, we will be applying all 15 principles of the decision model, although I'll only walk through some of them and leave the rest of them for you to um, look at yourself. So let's take a look at this decision table. It has four conditions, and these are listed under the column heading of conditions. So if you read that, you can see we have candidate initial interview rating, candidate compensation expectation, candidate personality rating, and candidate cognitive rating. And then um, we also have two actions listed under actions. We have candidate ranking and make job offer to a candidate. It also seems to have five sets of business logic or rules, and these are numbered one through five on the column headings at the top. And if we were to read one of these, the column whose numeral is two, we read it as if the candidate's initial interview rating is less than three and the candidate's compensation expectation is aligned with our expectations, and the personality rating is good, and their cognitive rating is excellent, then we want to give them a candidate ranking of one, and in terms of whether we should make a, them a job offer, the answer is yes. And so that's how we read this kind of, of table. 
So now let's see what we're going to do. We're going to walk through these six steps using the previous decision table as a starting point. And I'll point out, as I said, which principles each step applies to, but I will also point out to you why each step is important. So step one is to start with the decision table and turn it sideways. Step one is related to principle number one of the decision model, and that's called the tabular principle. And the principle number one states the following. The fundamental structure of a decision model is called a rule family, and it has two dimensions. One dimension is the heading, and the other dimension is the body. So because a decision table is a structure that has a heading and body, it's a good starting point if we don't have something else to start from. So we can look on the next page and see what it looks like when we turn it sideways. And let me explain that turning a decision table, like the one on the previous page on its side or sideways, means representing the conditions and, and actions as headings across the columns rather than down the rows. Now, um, so on this page, the original four conditions that you saw in the first column are now across the row, the top row, as part of the heading, and also the two actions are now also across the heading in the top. So let's take a moment on the next page to see why is it important to turn those sideways. They're sort of counterintuitive to if you've been doing the, old, the previous way of doing decision tables. Well, probably the oddest thing I'm going to say today is this one, is that um, the first bullet on this page says that turning a decision table sideways isn't really all that important. Um, it's not even necessary. And that's because principle one, what it does of the decision models, it tells you that you must have a heading and a body, but it does not force you to place the heading across the top and the body down the rows as I just did in the previous page. You don't have to do it that way. You, you need to do it whatever way works for you where you simply have what, all of the headings together and the body together. And the book actually points out other alternatives that you can do. However, in practice, the second bullet points out that turning them sideways the way you just saw it is the most preferred representation. And perhaps that's because it's very similar to lookup tables or, and relational tables. But there's another reason when you become familiar with the decision model. The other reason is when you apply normalization principles to the logic once you put it in your um, rule family table, almost all the time you end up with a body that has more entries in it then you have labels for conditions and con conclusions. And so that means like looking at it sideways the way I just presented to you is actually more practical for viewing it. Um, it's much easier to see because of the way the information is displayed on a page. But again, it's not, it's not all that necessary um, or mandatory, but that is 99.9% .9 of the way people do it. So I'm going to say turn it sideways if you're the first time you're looking to translate a decision table into a rule family. Okay, so now we need to take the next step and look at the next page where we've, all, we've reoriented the heading and the body of the decision table and now step two guides us in fixing our headings. Okay, we want them to conform to decision model principles for headings. And step two says convert to fact-based headings. So let's take a look at what that means. Step two is related to principle two and it's called the heading principle, of course, and it states that the heading of a rule family is a set of fact types. And fact types are nothing more than the names of pieces of information. So on this page, with our decision table turned sideways, we have conditions that seem to be pieces of information, such as candidate initial interview rating. But the columns under actions, um, we have the, the, just the very label action is not a label consistent with columns holding pieces of information. So the first thing we need to do is change that heading. We don't have the word actions anywhere in a decision model. We need to make it a name that suggests a piece of information. And because this column represents a piece of information which we are going to arrive at by executing the conditions, we're going to call it conclusions. So on the next page, all we've done is change actions to conclusions. So now we have columns for conditions and conclusions, but not for actions. However, we notice that one of our columns is called make job offer to candidate, which is really not a piece of information, is it? Usually when you see things like verbs, verbs are actions, or actions are verbs, and pieces of information are nouns. So make a job offer to candidate is not a noun. 
this is kind of what the, the more interesting part of coming up with a decision model. You're t talking about decision logic. I'm coming to a decision about something. I have to name it, uh, give it a name that represents the piece of information that is the decision. For something like this, the piece of information we might be called the candidate job offer eligibility. In other words, it's whether the candidate is eligible or not for us to make an offer. So we're going to change that name in the next page. And now we have all fact type names across our headings. Everything here can represent a piece of information with a definition and a set of values. And so with this conclusion, we are seeking whether or not the candidate is eligible to receive a job offer from us. What's important, though, is the actual action of making a job offer to a candidate does not belong in a decision model. It's external to it. That simply means that what happens to that action, it becomes a task in the process model, um, and it's usually a task that follows this particular rule family or decision model. And the task will then make the job offer depending on what result this particular rule family comes to. So, Next page, let's look at why is that important? Why are we obsessing over naming our headings? That is one of the biggest um, frustrations I have with decision tables that I see. There are a lot of actions in them, and they don't really mean actions. And if they do mean actions, then they should be someplace else. So step two is important because it adds rigor to the headings. And what I'm saying is rule families are not allowed to have a mixture of different kinds of headings. They only represent pieces of information, nothing more. And why is that valuable? OK, the purposes for doing that are the four purposes on this page. It ensures that everyone understands the logic because there is a glossary that provides complete definitions for all the facts that appear in a decision model. Number two, it provides input to IT because IT can use the headings as the basis for creating and confirming data models and object models. They don't have to try to figure that out. Number three, it provides the basis by which we can validate the logic in the decision model and that it covers the complete set of allowable values for every fact in the model because every heading has a glossary entry that tells me the values I have to be testing for. So I, can, I can't have any gaps in those values. And number four is interesting. Because the headings can only be pieces of information and they cannot be actions, this separates the notion that logic is about intellectual conclusions from the notion that of action and process. So in other words, logic makes an intellectual decision related to a piece of information while process is responsible for taking corresponding actions. So a decision model does not um, mix these two things up. So now, let's go on to step three. So we've turned it sideways and we've put fact types in our headings. And now we step three says separate the conclusions. So what does this mean? This is tied to principle five, which says the conclusion principle states that a rule family has only one conclusion fact type. And all that means is that each rule family has only one conclusion column. So this is critical because so far our decision table turned sideways with fact type headings had two conclusion columns. But you can see here that we've simply created two of these two dimensional tables. They have exactly the same conditions in each one, but we have only one conclusion, um, the candidate ranking in one of them, and we've separated out um, the other one in, this, in a separate, um, what's becoming a rule family. So why is it important? One of the most important things in the decision model is that every rule family has only one conclusion column, and that's often violated in decision tables, very, very often in practice. I believe you will see more standardization and, and, and movement towards only allowing one um, because, uh, because of all of these reasons. And these were reasons that are put forth with the decision model principles. The single conclusion column does the following. There's only one way to distribute logic among tables because each kind of conclusion has its own table. So if you need to make a change in a particular conclusion, there's only one place in the entire enterprise, in fact, that that change happens. That's number two. Number three, while it seemed from the previous page that we now produce duplicate tables, where we have exactly the same conditions but two different conclusions, this causes people to rethink whether, in fact, those two conditions um, are, should be 
determined based on the same conditions or whether we actually are just duplicating them because of the fact that we have two conditions or two conclusions in the decision table, then we have to fill in all the logic. So it, it allows you to rethink and clean up your logic. Number four, normalization principles. If you only have one conclusion column, you can now apply theoretical normalization principles to each table because it's atomic and detect errors in the logic for a specific kind of conclusion. It's more difficult to do when you have more than um, one conclusion. In fact, I'm not even sure how you could do it. Um, five, the single conclusion column is the glue behind entire decision models, and you'll see that in a few pages. It's basically like a foreign key in a relational model. It's what's going to link all these tables together. And if you have more than one of them, you are going to end up with a model that looks like a mess. And the last point is subtle, but very important. Um, and those of you who are familiar with the decision model may, rec will, may understand this more than others. But because every decision model has one co conclusion column, you can actually have different views of that conclusion. For example, suppose you have a decision about a credit compliance of, of an applicant, and they're applying for a mortgage. So you can have a conclusion called borrower credit compliance. But you might have a different model for that depending on the type of mortgage program the borrower is applying for. So the same borrower could be compliant for one and not for another one. And each of these is its own decision model or view, and they each have the same conclusion, but they have a different model structure underneath it. And so you have various models for coming to this conclusion, one for each mortgage program. So the single conclusion can ha take on different views, which implies that there's a whole different model under that same conclusion. It just has different logic depending on what you're using that conclusion for. So that's why step three is important. So now we move on to the first step that addresses the bigger perspective of log logic. We are going to create a structural model of the logic. And what that means is it's a recognition that logic, such as conditions leading to conclusions, has a standard structure that is characteristic of the very nature of logic itself. And because of that, that's why we have one and only one representation in our model following our principles. So now we're going to produce a diagram representing only the structure, which means you can do with a diagram first or the table first. And the structure is all about the names of its conditions and conclusions without the details themselves. So on this page, we have a structural diagram in green for the rule family table that we're building on the left-hand side. And this particular green um, structural diagram exposes all the elements of a rule family structure without exposing its details. So let me walk through what it needs to do. The structural diagram for a rule family, and like this one here, it has the following. It has to have a way to identify its one conclusion. The conclusion is the phrase above the solid line in the rule family shape, and in this case, the conclusion is candidate ranking. It also has to have a way to identify all the condition columns. So its condi the conditions are below the solid line, and we have one, two, three, four of them. It also has to have a way to identify how this particular rule family connects to other ones, and these connections are indicated by the fact that the conditions appear between the solid line and the dotted line. So here we know we are going to have four connections to this decision model. But finally, it has to have a way to identify all the data needed as input. And all the data that's needed as input means it's not connected to anything, and all of those are conditions that go below the dotted line. In this particular example, we don't have any behind, below the dotted line, and that tells us we're simply not finished with this um, decision model yet. We haven't gotten to the input data yet. Now, this is a very simple, but it's also an elegant structural diagram because you can tell a lot about the rule family and its relationships without having to look at the table behind it. You know what the table looks like by looking at the green icon. And so think about that from a software perspective. If I were to hit a, a, a key in software, it could generate the column headings for me and, knowing, and, and even a dependent structure for those that are going to have their dependencies. So it's simple, but it's, um, it's a little forward thinking. So on the next page, um, why is step four important? So I just want to go through the five reasons here. Um, it reduces the possibility of getting lost in the details because it's too easy to argue over what the actual details of the logic is um, when it might be more beneficial to look at the bigger picture. 
And number two, the structural diagram creates that bigger picture, a preliminary structural representation best, based on your best guess with, without investing in details. Um, number three, a structural diagram is actually an early and iterative deliverable. Now, while it's incomplete, it's certainly useful to the IT department, especially if you're uh, working within agile development methods. Number four, IT can easily and early start to align your fact types with the data sources, even before you have the details. They can build object models and even correlate, well, to data and data models and create working prototypes before you have all the details in the tables. So this gives you a lot of productivity benefits. And the fifth is important. The fifth point um, shows or talks about that the, that the diagram separates the structure from the details so that sometimes you can make a change in the details without changing the structure. If you're not adding rule families or you're not changing column headings, you don't have to change the diagram. And sometimes you change the diagram and you may not need to change the underlying table. And you can do it both ways. And you can have software that you will generate a skeleton of one versus the other as you're iteratively developing your decision model. So it's a whole new way of looking at building tables um, for logic. So now we move on to step five, and this is where the magic happens. Um, suppose the business states that it wants to specify logic that will ensure that we hire people that have the right personality. Um, so we've created this one particular table, and then we can look at this one. This is a structure that says, um, the business says the candidate's personality rating is going to be determined by how many things? Two. We're going to test their maturity rating, apparently, and we're going to test their integrity rating. Oh, that's an interesting idea. Well, what, what does that look like? Well, I don't know. I haven't figured out the details yet, but I do know one thing. I know that there will be another whole table that will conclude the candidate's maturity rating because it's between the solid and the dotted line, so I'm going to have a whole bunch of logic that is going to give me that as a conclusion. I'm also going to have one for the integrity rating. So you start those conversations and say, well, what exactly um, am I going to be using for that input? And, and you have more business-focused conversations. So if we go to the next page, look what happens. Notice that the conclusion on the previous page of candidate personality rating is a condition in the top rule family, and it's also a conclusion in the bottom rule family. So there's a connection that automatically pops it out at you, and which, by the way, software can detect and just plug it in there for you. We call it an inferential relationship, which simply means the conclusion of one is a condition in another. It's, not, it's magic. It's not, it's not creativity. It's not someone's idea. It's just the way the logic is. And um, so this is important. You know from this diagram that the top rule family will have four supporting rule families. You know that the bottom rule family will have two supporting rule families. You don't know the input because there aren't any conditions below the dotted line, so you know you're not finished yet. And again, the relationship between in this structure and its underlying details can be automated in software. I could click on one of these, and if there's a table behind it, I will see all the populated conditions and conclusions. So once you understand that if you take a decision table and you convert it to a rule family, and then you start looking at um, new conclusions that can be realized by other logic, you move into the realm of model management. And that's why step five becomes important. Step five is a breakthrough in managing logic in a model of its own. The inferential relationships are only possible, I said, if you remember, if each such table has only one conclusion column, otherwise you end up with a spaghetti model and not easy to validate or manage. So why is step five important? Because it makes sure you have your inferential relationships where the logic says they are. And this means they effortlessly materialize the entire web and of business logic as a cohesive model and not as a set of individual decision tables. It eliminates guessing, because if you change the logic, the, the inferential relationship automatically changes. It's easy to read and analyze by business people. There's one conclusion column. They can see how they link together. It hides complexity. It attracts higher management attention, and it elevates business rules and logic to a more strategic deliverable. 
So we move on to our last step, which is the one I'll leave for you folks. Our transformation ends with step six, which says let's go and confirm that all of the 15 principles of the decision model are satisfied in the entire model. That means that the logic in the model is complete. It has no gaps. It's totally consistent within itself, having no inconsistencies or contradictions, and it has no redundant logic. And so the principles address its structure, that it's technology independent, and it has the highest degree of integrity according to three forms of normalization. So what is if for those of you who have not seen decision models in the real world, this page shows the uh, previous decision table, and it's now been converted into rule family, and the rule family is part of a bigger picture. Um, and so basically, when we go out there, while you might have decision tables that fit together like this, I've never seen you folks or anyone connect them together. But the decision model, by definition, is built on those conditions, those connections first, and the details second. So we're building something bigger. Um, we've seen average decision models of 10 to 20 rule families. We've seen some with hundreds of rule families. And we have seen different models having many different views, like this might be candidate ranking um, in New Jersey model, but we could have a candidate ranking decision model in California having a different set of logic, but it's the same conclusion, it's just based on different territory. So reorienting your thinking from unconnected detailed decision tables to decision model structure changes the way you think and approach um, business rules and logic. And the most important step, of course, is that all 15 decision model principles are applied to an entire decision model, just not just to pieces of it. And in this way, the model comes alive as a living and tangible and more sophisticated business artifact. Um, the good news is that you can test it incrementally against all of those principles as you build the model piece by piece. So the next page just summarizes why step six is important. Um, it's because the principles deliver a model with the highest level of integrity. It is comprised of the most atomic reusable pieces, which you can learn from our book what that means. It's based on disciplined fact types that can be correlated to data models or object models, but we don't bother the business people with that correlation. We let them name them and define them the way they want them. It recognizes the difference between persistent data that, that you see below the dotted line versus data that is an interim data where it's, a, it's an interim conclusion from a rule family and it's not stored anywhere. It's normalized. It minimizes redundancies, um, which maximizes its integrity. It's predictable in, in its structure because there's one and only one core representation. There are not variations as there are with decision tables. And it's aligned with business performance and directions because we associate the conclusion of any decision model with what is what the return on investment is expected in terms of its impact on business performance. And if we don't hit that performance, we know exactly which conclusion it was that we thought would get us there. So we have to go back and revisit our model. So I hope you found um, something interesting in, um, in this presentation. So I just want to wrap up with two pages. Um, the next page simply summarizes each of the six transformation steps and the related decision model principles. And um, there are some principles in bracket here. I have not covered them in this presentation, but they are um, standing behind each of those steps. So turning it sideways is related to principles one, the tabular principle, principle eight, declarative heading principle, declarative body principle, and declarative inferential relationship principle. So that's one, eight, nine, and 10. And then we have two, four, three, and six. And essentially, it, at step six, we use the remaining principles, which are ones that look at the content and make sure that the content, not just the structure, um, is correct. And so a summary, all, we cover all the principles in these six steps, and a summary of all the principles can be found in Chapter 12 of our book in, um, in total detail, almost agonizing detail. And so my last page, then, is to leave you with important um, points from today. I believe that single decision tables are the tip of the iceberg when it comes to capturing logic and decision, and that like the relational model, when you look at a decision model and you look at it as something that is theoretically sound and not so difficult to do, it changes completely the way you capture, think, and manage, and leverage business logic. So imagine a whole new world of impact analysis on a holistic model. If you had software, you could just push a button. It would tell you where all of your logic errors are in a matter of seconds. 
Um, so impact analysis becomes much more comprehensive than with single unconnected decision tables. And new innovations in software now become possible. You can have views of rule families and views of whole decision models. You can do a um, copy, paste, and comparison of one decision model to another. Um, you have business decision management software that has governance control over creation and testing of decision models. You have normalization principles to third normal form, um, which is a rigor that you don't have necessarily with um, decision tables. And um, your decision models become a target for improved business thinking because they're more business oriented. And all of these things together have a profound effect on your organizational maturity and sometimes your actual business performance. So I'll leave you with one final thought. If you are comfortable using decision tables, that's great. That means that you're halfway there. Um, so if you feel that you are more comfortable creating decision models by starting with decision tables, feel free to do that. You, by following these six steps, you'll be able to create a rule family from a decision table and possibly connect it to other rule families. Um, but I might suggest that even if you do that, why don't you try, when you have a little extra time, just doing it from the top down. Look at the decision tables that you have and see if you can um, distill out their structure in a decision model diagram and see if you can find connections that exist between them that, that you would not have noticed in any other way. And, and that way you'll see that the decision model makes you think of a more holistic, more strategic perspective of the logic that you're putting in decision tables. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Michael. Excellent. Thank you, Barbara. This was a fantastic presentation. Um, we have a number of questions um, that, uh, that our audience is, uh, is posing. I would like to start with the first one uh, that says, a rule uh, family in a decision model seems to be another form of decision table. Can you explain specifically what makes a rule family different from a decision table? Okay, um, you've seen some of the things. Um, I covered some of the principles, such as the, the titles are always going to be fact types and not actions. Um, and you know there's only one conclusion. Uh, what I didn't say is all of the columns are anded together. So you can't have any ors, buts, or otherwises. In some decision tables, we see those things, ors, buts, and otherwises. Um, and um, the inferential relationship, of course, is sort of new, or it's, was kind of sleeping in the decision tables. But most important is there's only one diagramming notation. Because we published a book, because we published a notation and backed it with principles, everybody does it the same way. So you're not going to get that different variations. There's only one way, and software can validate every single decision model that's done in that way, which is not so true with decision tables. Yes, and there, there have been a couple of software-related questions. Uh, one was, uh, after a decision model has been translated into an object model and incorporated in code, how easily is, is code changed when business rules, um, uh, for instance, uh, values are changing? Okay, that's a great question. That's the holy grail. So thank you to the, the um, attendee who submitted that question. Um, the decision model, okay, the decision model is independent of how it's automated. Okay, so that, that's only half the question, right? Um, so a decision model can be, um, not that the decision made model is translated into an object model, but it's supported with an object model. And it itself is translated into something. It's either translated into Java code or it's translated into ILOG code. Um, and what we do in using um, Sapiens decision is the decision, the decision models are managed by business people or business analysts as decision models. And um, as they go in and they can change the logic in the model, create a new version of it, actually check for logic errors, actually generate test cases and test it, and then turn it over to IT. Now, if you're, if you're automating an iLog or rules or I think there's another engine, um, there is an adapter that automatically um, converts decision models into executable code for those particular engines. If you're doing home co code or homegrown Java or a homegrown engine, you're going to have to do that yourself. Um, but we do go, we do manage all of the changes in the decision model, not directly into the automated version. Um, and it sounds like that takes a, a lot of time, but um, one of our previous pr um, webinars pointed out how quickly that's done because there's almost a one-to-one, -one, depending on your automation technology, um, it's almost a one-to-one -one in order to know how to make the changes. But we want to put the decision models in the hands of business-oriented people um, and not forget about them and, and change the, the code out there. 
So it's the same question, but the answer is a little different. We're able to get, we're able to make that seamless through technology, and we're able to make it fast. There's an, uh, an another question in terms of uh, uh, the decision model and uh, OMG, right? Uh, um, this is the standards body. Um, is the OMG addressing decision tables and decision and the decision model? Um, yes, uh, the OMG is going to publish its paper, like I said, early in 2013, so that will be available to the public. Um, the goal of this, and this is only the first publication, but the goal of this particular uh, committee, they have four goals. To provide a standard framework for decision model types. Okay, so not the decision model, a la the decision model I'm talking about, but different types of decision models. Provide a standard notation for decision models, decision tables, and potentially other metaphors. Um, that are technology independent and provide common notations for decisions in business process models, the connection to BPMN in particular, and for interchangeability for decision models and tables among modeling tools. So I think what you're going to see is a common core for both the decision model type and decision tables. And then you'll have, um, you know, like our, our representation will have more details because we've, we've got a little more experience and some of the decision table experts will have other details that they add because they have their particular way of doing things. But the core will include all of those in, in, one in, a, in a general form. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, one listener I was just, is, is mentioning whether uh, drafts are available at this point uh, regarding of the paper. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. I, I, there is a draft. <laughs> I've seen the draft. Um, and we can follow uh, you know up. What, with I'll them. tell you what. Why don't you send me an email? And if you're not familiar with OMG, or maybe you are, um, I can I can put you in touch with the, the person who's running the committee. And um, uh, it may be the case that if you want, you know, you want to get an. I mean, uh, they they really want input. To be honest with you, um, so it's just a matter of um, you know whether you know uh, whether they'd share it before they have a preliminary release or they want input before that. But um, certainly, send us an email. We'll definitely put you in touch with the committee. There, there's also a couple of questions that are related to uh, the decision model and processes. Uh, yes. one, one question is, do you see this uh, as valuable and how for processes that are not automated in software applications? Oh, um, yes, yes, actually, I'm trying, yes. In fact, the book goes into the fact that the decision model doesn't have to be automated. Um, uh, we have, I'll give a real world example, we have an, um, a client where we, I think I mentioned this once before, they were, they had a claim process and some of the claims that were very difficult to process get kicked out and they go to nurses and doctors to, to figure out. And in, instead of having, um, you know, just leaving it up to each particular doctor or nurse, they use decision models to say, when you get this diagnosis code and this treatment code, here's the decision model that you follow in order to determine, um, you know, whether the treatment is valid and what to pay for it, because they wanted to get consistency in a human-based decision. And sometimes that's, that's, you know, you want a human-based decision because you want compassion or creativity, but the decision model can give you, you know, some um, recommendations in, in, in how to do decisions. So yes, definitely. Um, Definitely useful in, in human-based decisions. And, and uh, one of uh, uh, the question was whether we are sharing the presentation. And uh, and uh, just want to say that we will provide um, um, an access to the recording of this presentation. So for everybody that that has this question, now uh, there is also uh, in in another question. At times during uh, interview process, a candidate is interviewed by many folks. Does it mean that uh, the interviewer is following a decision model and collecting various attributes of the decision model? It seems to to, to relate to our goal-driven approach, right? Right. Um, yeah, I would. I mean, it depends on how you want to do that. If you want the decision to be based on certain criteria, then the interviewers definitely should be should be providing their input on their criteria. Um, the other interesting thing is your interviewers might come up with other criteria that you don't have in your decision model, and maybe you know that's that's a new version. Like, gee, maybe maybe we should be looking at X, and we're not asking that, or only two of our interviewers are are you know qualifying the, the candidate on other areas. And so I think definitely in that case, um, you want to get input from your interviewers to improve their decision making because you'd like to then go back and say which of these candidates accepted the job, which of the candidates. Uh, and why and why not, and, and which of them turned out to be good employees, and then you can even have the interviewers and people refine those conditions. 
Um, that's the whole point. It's, it's a, a decision model is a living document. It's not meant to be static. So uh, definitely would be helpful to have them in the process. And Barbara, there's an interesting question that, in my point of view, points to maintenance uh, 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 benefits that we have with, uh, with the decision model. Uh, the question is, we're using decision tables since they are directly governed by business people and uh, being executed as is in our enterprise IT environment. How can the decision model add value? Okay, uh, well I would say that if you are 100% satisfied with the business people being able to make those changes, um, I would not change it right now. Um, I think it would be more if the changes are difficult to make, if you, if it ends, if they end up being a, um, creating a process model that is a, more laborious than it needs to be. In other words, typically what happens is each of those decision tables it sits behind a different task in a process model. So first you do this, and then you do this decision table, and then you do that one. And you can take, if they're connected, you can take all of those and merge them together into one decision model and have one task box. Um, which really makes we've done that a lot, and that and that really um, streamlines your processes. So I, I think it would be more understanding the nature of your decision tables if they if they lend themselves to a connected model, and and whether the logic in those decision tables are is truly non redundant. Mm -hmm. um, if it's not normalized and business people are making changes, you're probably introducing a lot of errors um, that you correct later. Um, and of course, the big advantage of turn, going into decision models using software like Decision where business people can generate test cases and test entire models before they turn it over to IT and I'm guessing if you have individual decision tables you're not able to do that. Yes, so if those, if those things are of interest um, those would be reasons to do it. And, and I, I can uh, second that from, from my observations in the field. Uh, it really depends on the complexity of, uh, of the client situation and how much the, the the business logic is changing. So what we see right now in with a lot of cases in the financial services industry is that uh, due to the regulatory changes and the changes of the products, core banking applications uh, come under pressure to be adjusted to those new realities. And we see whenever that happens, that puts a, a huge strain on, on, on the system as it was developed, right? And... Uh, we, we see that uh, the maintenance becomes a difficulty since the people that have authored the logic might not be available any longer and, uh, and there is this kind of the connection lost. Uh, we, we see with, uh, with the decision model we have this connection available and everybody has a, has a quick way to really understand how, how things are related. But again, I think it really depends on on, on, on the nature of the business, as, as Barbara pointed out. And you know what, Michael, that raises another point. It really depends on whether the business people really can maintain them. Because I, I don't, I've seen decision tables where they get so convoluted and complicated that you end up really having to be a person who thinks like a programmer to make the changes, and that happens over time. But if they're simple enough for the business people, that's, you know, and they're really doing it, then, you know, you should, you know, hold on to that unless you, you see specific um, improvements which are measurable with the decision model and then then move towards that. That is, uh, do we have, yeah, we have one more question. Uh, the the model uh, you have demonstrated basically drills down uh, to a, a yes, uh, no on the atomic decisions. What about unknown unknowns in the decision? Oh, unknown unknowns. Um, we cover that in the book. I believe it's chapter four. Um, there are it covers unknowns and then unknown unknowns. So what you're saying is if if I don't have um, fact based if I can't make my decision using fully defined fact based logic, I think that's what you're asking. In other words, I do, I I know I'm going to look at these three conditions and I want the first one to be read and the second one they be making more than a hundred thousand dollars and the third one they live here, but I might want to look at some other things and I don't know what those things are. Um, well, the decision model as it is um, would only address the first, the ones you can identify, in which case we've actually delivered those. And with, um, in an automated system that comes out with and says, this is as far as we can go, now it's up to you. Um, and and a, an example, and sometimes in like a really chaotic situation, the one we use in the book is like 9-11. At 9-11, there were lots of decisions that had to be made and no one knew what to look at where. and 
Um, so you can use decision models for chaotic situations um, to identify and pull apart the things you do know versus the things you don't know. And uh, I cannot resist. Uh, we still have a significant amount of people on online. There's one really important question, and that is, uh, can you revisit why not multiple conclusion uh, columns? Uh, complete this <laughs> testing is an attribute on the condition columns. What other drawbacks are there? I think that's an excellent question. Um, Michael, what was the last sentence? Uh, completeness testing is an attribute of the condition columns. What uh, other drawbacks are there? But I think the first part is okay. why not why not multiple conclusion columns? And I think that's a very important question. Okay, let me, um, and I'm no, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make this clear enough. By the way, we get that question all the time. We get resistance from that all the time. And, and every single project that we have done with every single client, after like, you know, the first part of the project, they say, I get it. I get it. But it takes doing it to get it. Okay, it's the same reason if you're a data person, why don't you have two primary keys in a table? You can't have two different primary keys in a table because then the way you link tables together becomes a total mess. So you have to pick one and the other one becomes an alternate key. Okay, so that, that's a data correlation. Um, however, let's stick to the decision model. Um, you can have, you can only have one conclusion because that's the one that's going to connect you to another table. However, you can have other columns that are useful. For example, and the metadata columns, you can have a column for next to a conclusion that represents the message that's going to be sent back when that row evaluates to true. Um, and, and you can even have different kinds of messages, messages for software, messages for user. You can put, um, you can even you can put other kinds of metadata, but the only thing that's going to link to another table is the conclusion. Otherwise, you end up with spaghetti COBOL code, and 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 you will soon not be able to manage your model at all. And you you're going to have to just trust me on that one. If 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 you, if you want to look through the book and take some of our models and add multiple conclusion columns and start to draw the the lines um, among them, you'll see that it becomes a mess. Excellent, excellent. Um, can decision models help with focusing on the right information or is it only as good as the people building the models? Okay. Well, I thought we were at the last question about three questions ago, Michael. Okay. I, that's <laughs> yeah, too no, good, that's fine. You know? <laughs> that's, that's fine. Okay. That's, oh, that's a really good question too. Um, a decision model is only as good as the people who are building the decision model. Um, and what does that mean? That means that if, if, whatever constraints the modeler puts on themselves um, is going to limit the decision model. So what does that mean? Um, I've been in a situation where we were, we were, we were working with visionaries. They had a, a crisis, in, a crisis in a decision and they, the business executives got together and said, this is the criteria we need to use to make this decision better. And we built decision models using that criteria. And it turned out that we didn't have half of that data available. The, the organization didn't have half the data. So they said, you have to go ahead and do the decisions only based on data that we already have. So what we did is we created the same decisions with only the data that we had. And now they were able to compare. If we really had the data that we needed, you could visually see how richer that decision would be from the one that didn't have that data. And so, um, you know, the decision model is only as good as the modeler if they, if they can be visionary, if they can break boundaries in putting the logic in there, if they're the best thinkers in the company, you'll get better decision models. Now, if, you, if, you don't, if your decision models don't hit the mark, one of the things we always do, like I said, is we try to tie a decision model to an ROI. So in the cancer um, diagnosis code example, there were certain codes that they felt they were, they were inconsistent in their paying, so they tracked the decisions that they made over time from different um, claims and went back and, and could say, hey, this decision model isn't working for this diagnosis code. We are still, in, you know, we are not still consistent, but in the other ones we are. And then we could take that decision model and refine it until we reach the consistency that we wanted. So I always tell people, don't be nervous about doing decision models. They don't have to be perfect the first time out the door. They're not going to be perfect. But but now you have something tangible that you can measure and you can say what's wrong with it. It's not what's wrong with me, it's what's wrong with this logic. This is where we want to go. It's not getting us there. 
you know, how can we fine tune it? But it is, it's like, yeah, it's, it's human intelligence is what it is, um, you know, in decision model format. So you can get smarter and smarter as you, as you, as you manage your decision models through time. Very good. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, this, this basically concludes the Q&A section. Um, I will continue to give a quick overview about the engagement model and uh, a quick repeat of, uh, of what we have uh, introduced uh, at the beginning for everybody that were not able to, to listen to it, so where they can learn more about the decision model and the upcoming events. Um, Barbara, thank you so much uh, for, for the presentation today. It was a lot of fun. I also hope that some of the uh, people in the audience send us some, some questions, uh, also maybe some suggestions for other webinars. Uh, as, uh, as I mentioned, we, we have uh, two, two upcoming, but uh, 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 the team is, is working on new topics and we, of course, want to keep it always fresh. Michael, Michael, can I just say one thing? Um, I just want to mention one thing about the OMG. I'm sorry for the person who asked the question. Um, no there problem. is only one. There is only the the, the 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 committee went out for submissions, and they've all con consolidated into one submission. That's a good thing. We have one committee working on this, and there are there's um, significant representation from IBM, Oracle, Tibco, um, and other companies. So so um, so this paper is probably a pretty interesting paper. Um, I don't know who, what company the, the person who asked the question was from, but there are some major um, software companies on that committee. And, and I can share the so, link sorry, to the, the, the previous uh, meeting last year, right, that we had uh, regarding decision model notation. So if for yes. anybody yes, who is interested. Yeah. 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 Very good. Um, yeah, with that, uh, I, I, I will uh, move forward to, to the uh, engagement model uh, for everybody who is interested to to. See uh, get a better understanding about how to implement it or how to get provision in a decision model. We offer skills and knowledge transfer at Knowledge Partners International consisting uh, of, a, of, of a set of tools, uh, training, uh, certification, mentoring, and if interested, uh, we help also in building a center of excellence. The typical rollout is we have an initial training of two days and then depending on whether you're waterfall or agile, we would prepare for first sprint. Uh, in this uh, sprint zero, we define the sprint release plan. Uh, we'll take about two to six weeks. And then we break down the target projects in multiple sprints that are uh, one to two, three week, uh, one to three weeks. And it also depends on how your typical sprint duration is. Uh, the sprints are fixed price and time boxed. And, uh, and, and uh, during this sprint, we have a knowledge transfer. So um, the objective is to get your team independent uh, in applying the decision model. We have uh, heard today that there is a set of principles and uh, an approach that is consistent and unambiguous. But still, it requires some, uh, some deep understanding about all, all those things, how they, how they relate it in, in particular how they are related to your particular situation. And the objective here in the target project is really to help your team to become fluent in that. Uh, we would uh, withdraw ourselves more and more as the project uh, moves on. Uh, in about three months, uh, participants should be uh, ready to, uh, to go into certification. And then we would uh, start a Stepman program. That's our mentoring program where the mentor is uh, most of the time off-site and it's basically just the support uh, for, the, for the team, for your team that is conducting the, the project. During this time, we would uh, provide you with, uh, with tools. Uh, then potentially later on, you, you come to a decision or to, to move with the tool that, uh, that we have used during the, the time, implement the what we call business decision management system, BDMS, and then finally, automate the the application within your infrastructure that's in a in a nutshell uh, a, a quick overview if if you need more information please feel feel free to to contact us uh, we are also providing um, lunch and learns for uh, for companies and uh, uh, so called the day of discovery for uh, interested parties where we would uh, take uh, an example of your company and uh, and show how it would apply to the decision model. 
Now, how to learn more about the decision model, that's the repeat of, uh, of the presentation in the morning, uh, not in the morning, but at the beginning of this presentation. Um, Barbara mentioned the book, the book, uh, the decision model of business logic framework linking business and technology is available as a hardcover, but also as a Kindle version um, through Amazon. Uh, we have a series of articles, I, I don't know the number, but uh, I think it's about 50, uh, about different topics uh, related to the decision model. We post uh, our webinar recordings, uh, we have a library of uh, white papers and articles, and of course also templates. So please feel free to uh, take advantage of the free material. Um, we, we are represented uh, with articles at uh, TDAN, uh, this is the Data uh, Administration Newsletter, Modern Analyst and the Requirements Networking Group. Uh, you uh, can also uh, reach out to one of our partners. Um, we have partners in the area of training, but also uh, in areas of consulting. Uh, these partners are um, worldwide. Uh, Sinta is uh, located in the UK. Uh, Good Methods Global is a sister company of ours focusing on iRISE visualization services. Uh, Rural Management Group is in the Netherlands and uh, Strand and Donsland in Denmark. Sapiens is our software partner. We have a very close relationship to Sapiens. Uh, they have uh, designated a whole entire department developing uh, the business decision management software called Decision. Uh, it's very comprehensive. It has very powerful glossary, um, interesting testing capabilities. Everything that Barbara explained today is in the software. Uh, and of course, it's in compliance with all 15 uh, principles as outlined in the book. But even more importantly, it also covers uh, latest developments that are not covered in the book and are really very important. Uh, as you can in, imagine, the decision model is not an uh, academic uh, uh, product. It is really something that the people use out in the marketplace. And uh, together with Sapiens, we try to be as uh, responsive to the needs as possible. So there is much more functionality than, uh, than in, a, in, in the last, uh, last two, uh, two years when the, when the book came, uh, came out. Now, interact with us, uh, join the LinkedIn group, uh, the decision model. Uh, we have two groups there. One is focusing on networking and interaction uh, between uh, the uh, your peers, but also with the originators of the decision model, the software vendors, uh, and, uh, and, and also people that just try to, uh, to implement it on their own. Um, the decision model group, uh, the news group, is, is focusing more on uh, announcements in terms of events, um, webinars, and, uh, and, and uh, promotional material. Now, announcements, uh, our upcoming events. We have a webinar together with our sister company, Good Methods Global, September 28th, at the same time, 12 to 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern uh, Standard Time or Eastern Daylight Savings Time. Um, this webinar uh, provides you an overview how visualization can shorten time to market, reduce costs, and increase quality of requirements. Highly recommended. It's also a tie-in to our requirements uh, service program called First Step. So if you are uh, interested in, in optimizing your uh, SDLC or reviewing uh, how you are uh, collecting, eliciting requirements, that's an excellent presentation brought to you by Good Methods Global and uh, its managing partner, Abhilash Krishna. Uh, now, we have a webinar on October 17th with Larry Goldberg. Uh, this is an, an intro uh, in to the decision model, as Barbara pointed out. If you, if you don't want to read the primer or if you have read the primer and want to, to, to know more about it, that's a, that's a good opportunity. Um, again, same time, October 17th, uh, 12 to 1 EDT. And uh, our training partner, B2T, offers a decision modeling essential class uh, in Atlanta, October 23rd to 24th. There are still seats available, and uh, I highly recommend uh, B2T. Uh, they, uh, they have been founding member of IIBA and uh, provide a, a very strong portfolio of uh, 
BA business analysts uh, analy analysis related uh, training classes. One of them is decision modeling essentials and uh, if you are in the area that is, a, is an excellent way to uh, become more proficient in, uh, in decision modeling. Now you can also meet with us. Uh, we are exhibiting at the MBA, the Mortgage Bankers Association Annual Convention and Expo. Uh, it takes place in Chicago, October 21 uh, to 24th. If you are in Chicago and would like to meet with us, this might be a good opportunity as well. Just let us know and uh, we might uh, be able to connect with you outside of, of the exhibition or at the exhibition. Um, then an uh, important event in the, in the field of uh, business analysis is of obviously the Building Business Capability in Fort Lauderdale, October 28th to November 1st. We have a booth together with Sapiens, our software partner, and uh, uh, there are a number of our clients that are uh, presenting there. So if you have a chance to attend that, just let us know. Uh, we also can arrange a presentation of decision. Um, we are we are we have a booth, a joint booth together. And uh, if you want to get your book signed by Barbara or Larry, that's obviously also an, a possibility. Now this brings me to the end of the presentation. Thank you so much uh, for your for your participation and great questions. Um, look forward to have you join our next uh, uh, webinar. Thank you so much. Bye bye.